This week, we'll continue our discussion of、uh, the bridge controller, which is an example of reactive systems. Let's now recap very quickly about what we achieved from last week. So we introduced you to this particular modeling problem of bridge controller by walking you through the its requirements documents. Remember, e description versus r description. Accordingly, we declare our initial model by、uh, declaring its、uh, so-called state space with the constant and also variables and also the invariance. And we spoke about how how the whole system can really、uh, act as an abstract state machine. Specifically, the state transition will be done by actions of each events. And actually, specifically, we we implicitly indicated that the design for our two system,、uh, our two events, ML in and ML out, may not be so appropriate because somehow they led to invariant violation in some counter、uh, event traces. Right? That's something、uh, we actually spoke about. And Uh, at the end of the、uh, last week, we also spoke about the idea about the before after predicates, which will formalize the actions for each events. Specifically, we talk about the notion between the pre states and also post states. So these are all the concepts which you assume you are already have already learned and studied. And if you got any trouble understanding、uh, any one of them, they are quite fundamental, which will be required for all the subsequent、uh, case studies that we'll do or refinements that we'll do. Make sure you understand them, or reach out to me if you got any trouble. So this week we're gonna get much more formal. Well, actually, we already paved the way to actually、uh, to to be able to be more formal from last week. So this week we're gonna talk about specifically how invariant preservation can be enforced formally. Specifically, we want to see how we can generate systematically proof the so-called proof obligations for invariant preservation, and then we can see how we can. Uh, have a proof system, so-called sequ-、uh, sequence calculus using inference rules, and then to see how we can uh, uh, conduct the formal proofs. So that'll be the flow for this week. We got much to do, so let's now、uh, get to it. Let me start by uh, just uh, reviewing very quickly about what the issues is. So whenever we talk about how you de-、uh, the design of your events, so maybe for a particular model, you may have multiple events that you have already、uh, specified. Whenever you want to review about how appropriate the design is, you definitely want to get some feedback. So where can we get a feedback? Well, if you use the Rodent tool, the Rodent will simply give you feedback by saying if there's any proof obligation that's not being discharged. That would be a very good feedback to tell you that either the property you specify may be wrong, or maybe the machine events maybe somehow did not have enough guard. For example. The guard may not be strong enough, so you really de- you definitely want to strike a balance between these two、uh, these two sides and then to see which one to fix. All right, so sp- let's now talk about the design of events specifically with respect to invariant preservation. Let's now review、uh, quickly. And this is our current design for the two events. Remember, M L out stands for a car going out of the main lane into the island,、uh, into the island bridge complex to be.、Uh, Island bridge compound to be more precise, right? Remember the abstraction we apply in the initial model, and this event on the other hand,、uh, called MLN, well, basically it's、uh, denoting a car going into the main lane from the、uh, bridge island、uh, compound, right? That's why the the variable n should be decremented, right? That's something assumed you're already familiar with, and the potential issue for these two events, of course, we have to formally prove it, is. They only specify about how the variables should be updated. I would say, as far as the update is concerned, they definitely make sense. They makes perfect sense. However, there's one thing you want to always remember: whenever you want to make changes to your variable of the machine, you cannot just make the ch-、uh, changes unconditionally. They should be under the conditions of the invariants being preserved. That's something you want to keep in mind. That's a lesson, right? And so that's invariants. We want to make sure they are, they are never violated. If you only try to look at the words invariants, literally, it simply means some condition that should always hold invariantly true. They should never become false. And these are the two invariants we want to make sure for our initial model between the interleaving of any events、uh, that acts as a state transition. These invariant conditions are never violated. That's something we want to make sure, right? Let me now do a little bit of、uh, annotations over here just to. Brush up your memory quickly, so we'll be ready to do something more formal, right? And when we talk about the variables over here, so that's really the dynamic part for the system, right? Dynamic part, meaning that it's subject to changes. Dynamic part, meaning that 
values might change. Via actions of enabled events. And remember the notion about an event being enabled over here, right? An event being enabled simply means the guards of the events are actually true. Guards evaluating to true. A potential issue which I mentioned last time, if you actually got uh, events whose guards are simply missing, which is equivalent to declaring uh, the guards as being true. In that case, that means the events are always enabled. That may be a warning sign because typically uh, the, in, uh, the, the enableness of uh, each event should be somehow limited. You should not be able to just uh, uh, execute the action of the events under any circumstances. There should be some constraint, especially if you got some invariant conditions that uh, it is almost certain that the guards should be added to the events. So that's maybe the current problem for our design of the events. That's something we'll get into and tr try to justify formally, right? And but I want to remind you very quickly, at the moment for ML out and also for ML in, right? The guard is simply missing. It will be as if the guard is actually true. We will see the syntax about how you can declare guards for each event a little bit later. But for now, you can just understand conceptually, if the guard is missing, it will be as if the guard is actually true. So guard is also true for uh, the, the events, for both events, meaning that for ML out and also ML in, these two events at the moment, according to our specification, they are always enabled, right? That's a very important uh, thing to also notice as well. So these two events are always enabled. Meaning that the changes specified by their actions may just occur at any states. Even if the change is going to lead to some invariant violation, it will still be enabled and maybe executed. That's according to our specification, right? That's really the essence about what might be wrong about our current design, but we'll definitely will get to the formal justification very soon. Right, and for the invariant part, it's uh, very important for me to uh, emphasize again. For invariance, it's simply a condition that must hold true for your system. Uh, conceptually, think about it is really some important properties of your system. Important properties of the system that must always hold, uh, hold true, always hold true. And I'll try to make this a little bit more formal in just a moment. That should always, uh, that must always hold true, meaning that there should be no states in your system that will actually violate uh, this invariant condition, meaning that one of the invariant condition over here may just evaluate to false. That's something you will never ever want, uh, want it to happen. Right, should always hold true. And let me try to give you a little bit of more uh, formalism over here to make it precise. That should always hold true. All right, it's really important uh, phrase. And how can we actually uh, formulate this? Let's say using universal quantification. Since we mentioned that, we want every state that can possibly uh, possibly be uh, resulted in by event interleaving to always satisfy the invariant. How can we specify that, right? Let's try that, right? I'm gonna specify in two ways. Since we know when we use logical quantification, you can always convert from one into the other and vice versa. I think uh, uh, having both uh, be, uh, having both equivalent expressions uh, written down together, that can give you a little bit more insight about what's going on. Let, let's, see, uh, let's see both. Let me start with uh, the universal quantification case. So we want to say, remember we talk about the notion of state space, right? So state, the state space is simply just a list of configurations. Specifically, the configuration that we're talking about over here uh, consists of constant and also variables, like a different combination for their values. So that's why we said before, if you really want to uh, develop test cases, like a uh, JUnit testing 
for the entire state space is simply not feasible because of the combinatorial explosion that we have on the uh, state space, right? Let me write it down. It's more like a review from before. So when we talk about configurations, it's mainly about the combinations of the variable values, the variable values, and also the constant values. And they all together should be somehow subject to the invariance conditions that you actually uh, specify for your system, which uh, must hold true uh, for any uh, any possible state. And if uh, each state space that's implied by your model may or may not be consistent. May or may not be consistent. And more precisely, let me just give you one more uh, one more comments over here. The state space over here, let's say over here. So what do I mean? May or may not be consistent. Let me give you the definition for what do I mean by not consistent. It will be inconsistent state space. Right? I'll say SS for sure, state space. If some combination of variable and constant violate the invariance. Right, so here I say some, meaning that if you can provide a witness, in that case, you can definitely prove that the state space is actually inconsistent. The example that we got from last week, let's just re, uh, re, uh, review very quickly. You can think about this particular state space, you can see con uh, uh, which uh, consists of the constant, the variables, and also the invariance over here, right? So the state space, we, what we concluded from last time was inconsistent because for this particular simulation of your system, you might just end up in a variable and constant combination two and minus one which violates the invariance over here, right? Similarly, you can just find another counter example being an event trace over here, and you might just end up being in a combination of the variable two and minus three, which violates the invariance over here. So this is what I meant. It's a state space, but it's inconsistent because somehow the variable and constant combination may actually violate the invariance due to the two, uh, due to the transitions over here, either ML in or ML out, somehow was not designed properly. Well, more precisely, the, those state transitions lack a uh, proper guarding constraint, which we're gonna talk about later uh, this week, all right? So hopefully you're following so far. It's really important to really try to connect all the terminology that we have been speaking about. We definitely need to uh, keep using them, you know, for each case study. All right, let me now, uh, uh, specify the uh, condition for uh, this particular important uh, properties, right, for the system. How do we uh, express our commitments to say that always the invariant must hold true, right? Given that we ha we know uh, we review what a state space is. Let's now try to specify that. Let me use the, this box over here to actually specify that formally, okay? And I promise I'm gonna give you two versions over here using the two quantification. Let's do that quickly, okay? Version number one. We want to say for every S, okay? So we learn about universal quantification and S is simply just a member of some configuration in the state space, right? So I'm going to say state space, right? It's uh, just a configuration over here, right? If uh, it's a valid uh, co uh, configuration, in that case, the invariance of the system must be satisfied, the invariance. So that means if you try to evaluate the invariance on the states, it must be true. Invariance, that should be true, right? So that's uh, the first version over here. We say for every possible combination of the states, uh, of the state space, oh, wow. for every member of the state space, which would be a configuration consisting of the co a combination of variables and also constant. 
for every such state, you want to make sure when you try to evaluate the invariant conditions, which might be several, but in this case, in this case we got two for the initial model. It should be true. All right, that's one way to see it. It would be equivalent as follows. Let's try to let's try to do that. Okay, it would be equivalent to according to our conversion theorem uh, that we review uh, in the early, uh, in the beginning of the semester. Let's see how we can do that. Well, the the way to think about it is that means we cannot really find any witness that will actually violate the invariance. So how do we express that? It is not the case that it is not the case that there exist a, a states s should be a member of the state space and each uh, s should be a member of the state space and also not the case that the invariance will evaluate true All right, so just don't forget about the uh, parentheses over here. So these two quantifications are simply equivalent to each other. Let's uh, review quickly. This one here is saying that every possible states that might be uh, that might be led to by different state transitions should satisfy the invariance. And it is not the case that you can find some counter example which will violate the uh, invariance. So you can think about only this part is about the way to disprove that uh, that your system is actually uh, consistent, right? So this part over here, well, not including the negation over here. If somehow I can find you a state that's in the, that's, uh, if I can find you a state that's a valid combination of the variable and constant, but that particular state evaluate uh, that particular state being evaluated by the invariance will give you false. In that case, it would be a witness to disprove that your system being consistent. Right? That's exactly the two witnesses that we talked about last time. Right? I'm just trying to draw some connection, but just to try to be a little bit more formal. So this part, the, uh, the orange part will be the witness. Witness for disproving the state space being consistent. All right, so that will be the last point I would like to mention in this current part, okay? So it will be very important for you to really see uh, why, okay? It will be the witness for you to disprove that the system being consistent. All right, so these are the keywords you want to uh, make sure you understand. All right, let me go back to the slides to see if I miss anything, all right? All right, so yeah, that's the idea we talk about uh, abstract state machine with the state transitions and we, we were able to find witnesses for our initial model that invariants might be violated in uh, in some certain states. And that's the uh, witness condition that I just highlighted, right? You can think uh, that's exactly the witness condition over here. All right, let's see. And what we will do uh, for the rest of uh, this week, we will try to formulate our commitments to preserving the invariant because it's so important. If you cannot preserve the invariance in all the states, that means your state space is not consistent, right? So what we will do is we're going to formulate such commitment as a so-called proof obligation or PO, right? Or sometimes people talk about verification condition or VC, right? So you want to make sure these two acronyms really make sense to you when I mentioned that. One is called proof obligation, mean, meaning that you're obliged to do so. And also verification condition, meaning that if you want to verify the correctness of your system, these are the conditions to really satisfy. So these are these two terms are interchangeable, right? PO versus VC, they are the same. Alrighty, let's now move on to the next part and we'll talk about how we can uh, use the so-called sequence calculus to really do uh, the formulation.